Now you talk about terror All my day Hammer all my day Hi, I'm Chris Edges. Welcome to Days of Revolt. Today we're going to speak about the uprisings in the 1960s and the early 1970s that were response to the failures of the civil rights movement and the draconian use of force and violence, even terrorism, by the state to crush radical movements that sought justice. Between 1967 and 1973, annual fatal assaults on law enforcement officials rose from 76 a year to 131 a year. We saw hundreds of rebellions, many of them including the use, included the use of arms in American cities such as Detroit and Newark between 1965 and 1968. And the state's response to this upheaval created the mechanisms of control that are in place today. As Regis Debray said the revolution revolutionizes the counter-revolutionaries. And so we're going back in time to look at that rebellion, at what the state did, at the response, at the efficacy of violence with two great revolutionaries uh, who are in the studio with me today. First is Eddie Conway, a member of the Black Panther Party in Baltimore spent 44 years in prison, framed for a murder of a police officer uh, that he did not commit. The other person in the studio with me is Ogeri Latulo, who spent 28 years in prison, 22 of them in isolation, and was a member of the Black Liberation Army, a movement that unlike the Panthers, uh, exclusively focused on underground acts of violence against the state apparatus. Uh, Audrey, when you look back at that particular moment in time, uh, a time when the state in cities like, for instance, Philadelphia had essentially open season on black people, uh, and I think as conscious as some of uh, us are about the indiscriminate use of force by police uh, against people of color today, it was of course far worse uh, in terms of numbers. Uh, and in terms of um, uh, even a s targeted assassinations from Fred Hampton on down. As a young revolutionary, was your decision to embrace violence born out of a belief that the nonviolent civil rights movement led by Dr. King had been a failure? Yes, yes, it most definitely was. The state didn't give us an, an option. We sat back and watched the numerous murders of, of our people take place in a, across the country in America, right? So we had uh, discussions about, you know, what should be done. And so resulting from those discussions, right, we, just, we decided to, you know, form clandestine uh, you know, combat units and go on the ground and, and function on a clandestine level to, you know, check acts of state prompted terrorism in our communities. As a result, a lot of activities, uh, some, of us, some of us were captured, some of us were, you know, killed in action. Do you think that it had an effect oh, oh, in that, terms of the state? Yes, because, of, like, the, po the, the, the police in our communities, their murderous behavior, you know, slowed down somewhat. Now they had somebody to answer to their aggression. Because the opposition was, well, don't really stop this aggression, just oppose that aggression with aggression, right? So it definitely had an effect. And that's what's needed today in our communities because the police is back on a uh, you know, uh, kick of uh, just murdering us without regard, murdering us without any kinds of uh, consequences, right? They don't fear us or respect us. So that's why they do what they do. Well, you see a similar process where you have nonviolent protests, Black Lives Matter, walking through the streets of Ferguson, Baltimore, New York, and yet they keep shooting poor people of color with utter impunity. Was that a very similar kind of experience, do you think? At that time, until people decided to take actions towards, towards the state. And, and uh, Eddie, 
you, by the time the Black Liberation Army was formed, you were already in prison, I think. Yes, that's correct. Uh, right. Um, and I know that your sort of conversion, or you were actually a sergeant in the U.S. Army, picked up a newspaper, saw uh, tanks, I think, right, on the streets of Newark. Yes. With 50 caliber machine guns pointed at groups of women. Yeah. And uh, I think as you explain, and this is uh, Eddie's book, Martial Law, The Life and Times of a Baltimore Black Panther, lays this out, you understood being in the military that those mechanisms are electronic. And once you pull that trigger, if it was pulled, uh, even if you wanted to stop it, you wouldn't be able to stop it until 25 bullets are fired out. And, and uh, 50 caliber machine guns have bullets about this size and this big around. Yeah. Um, and that, you never put your army uniform on again except to leave the army. You went back, you joined the Black Panthers. Was your feeling the same as Ogeries that uh, all of the nonviolent efforts on the part of uh, Dr. King and others had failed? Not initially. Initially, when I uh, returned home, I joined the uh, NAACP and I thought the problems could be corrected, uh, that some reform was necessary in America. I thought the uh, civil rights movement was still working on that. Uh, it was only after I started working with them that I realized that the amount of violence directed toward organizers in the black community and activists was, was enormous and that it would be foolish and crazy not to defend ourselves if we were really intending on organizing. And so that forced me to kind of like look at other organizations that uh, had the policy of self-defense in the Black Panther Party uh, at that time was advocating self-defense in the process of organizing. Which is different from the Black Liberation Army. Which is different because self-defense in the the defense of the community and the defense of our survival programs and the defense of uh, educating our people in the defense of organizing our communities as opposed to uh, aggression. Right. I mean, the Black Panther Party, for all intents and purposes, was a political organization. Yes, that's the correct. The Black Liberation Army was an armed militant group that did not really do political organizing. Would that be correct? It was Audrey? political military. Right. Now. I mean, black people constitute, what, 12% roughly of the population. So there's no hope of a rebellion by the use of violence. What, um, what did you hope at, at best to achieve? To encourage people that they had the, uh, the human right to defend themselves and their communities. We felt that examples needed to be set to check the state's, the state's sponsor acts of terrorism going on in our communities, right? We feel best that the best way to do that was by opposing aggression with aggression. And so matters involved from that. I mean, it, you could argue that the use of violence on the part of revolutionaries essentially created, as Dubray says, it, you know, that it revolutionized the counter-revolutionaries because it created the mechanism uh, starting with COINTELPRO, which doesn't exist in name, but exists in reality today, it created many of the mechanisms uh, that have created the, the carceral state, the, 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 the prison industrial complex, and the militarized police, and the use of it, the stripping of civil rights. I mean, it, it, the, the RICO Act, which was passed in 1970 by Richard Nixon, uh, ostensibly against organized crime, and is immediately used uh, against uh, leftist groups, including the Panthers. Um, in, in a sense, that's a language the state knows how to speak really well, which is violence. Um, and I'm wondering if it, it was more that you reached such a saturation point where you just couldn't take any more violence and you reacted in terms of affirming your own dignity and your own sense of self-worth, even with the acceptance that that reaction would give the state an excuse to create the mechanisms that are in place today. I don't know what you think about that, Eddie. Well, I think one, is, one we have to look at the time. I mean, it wasn't just the state that was exercising violence uh, domestically, internally. The state was exercising violence across the globe, around right. the world. You had Vietnam happening. You had uh, all sorts of rebellions in Africa. You had uh, 
rebellions and conflicts in South America, in Europe, in Greece, in uh, uh, Italy, in Ireland, et cetera. There, it was a global reaction to the violence that the state was perpetrating around the planet in its effort to steal resources. I think what happens with the Black Panther Party first uh, in terms of self-defense and then the Black Liberation Army in terms of reacting to that violence is the fact that people realize that even though we were 12 or 13 percent of the population, the planet was really at war with the empire, if you want to put it in those they, kind of terms. And it did cause a reaction, like all empires react uh, when the colonies or colonized people or the domestic people uh, rebel, they come up with solutions. And America has been so far the most powerful empire in the world, and they have all those lessons. And so yes, they have came up with systems now that's an oppressed and surveilled everybody on the planet. Well, the, the systems that they used in Vietnam, I mean, they looked at the radical left in the 1960s in the same way they looked at the Viet Cong. I mean, they were quite explicit about it, and they used the same counterinsurgency techniques, which are in place today, that they used in Vietnam domestically, uh, including bringing in helicopters, uh, including creating SWAT teams, uh, More you know, informants. Informants, centralized databases that were hooked up nationally. All of that came out of the militant rebellion that you were both involved in in the 1960s. But, but, but let me just add, because if you go to Indonesia, if you go after World War II, those same tactics were used that were used in the, uh, uh, the, the reclaiming the, uh, uh, the uh, colonies in Indonesia, they were used in, uh, against Vietnam early on. Those same tactics were used around the world that were used in Algiers against the Algerians, right. and they just became more sophisticated as the people that were losing their empires up the ante. So the government, they, they refined it, their tactics, their methods of approach to our resistance, right, because they learned from the 60s and 70s, right, what worked and what didn't work. And they just, they just took it to another level, right? They, they, would have, they would create more informants inside and outside uh, the system, within the prisons and outside the prisons, right? Uh, but they would uh, offer a lot of money. Uh. Well, because they had so many informants and because these radical left groups employed violence as a mechanism by which they resisted, uh, these informants were able to orchestrate internal divisions a splitting of the Panthers uh, between New York and Oakland, uh, and even at some points uh, orchestrate assassinations by one faction against another. Uh, and that raises the very issue that you faced in the streets, and I know you exposed, was his name Warren Hart, mm -hmm. who founded the Black Panther Party in Baltimore, and yet it turns out was a member of the National Security Agency, is that correct? Yes. Then went on to wreak havoc in Canada and where then he went to Jamaica Caribbean, after that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so the, the question, and, and this was, is also true within the prison system, with that ability of the state to saturate movements like that with informants raises the question of whether the only effective form of resistance is one that is completely transparent in a sense that Dr. King's movement was transparent because with that many informants and we, with even the head of the Panther Party in Baltimore being in essence a police agent, uh, doesn't that give the state the capacity to, 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 uh, to make these entities self-destruct? Well, you know, I'm, you know, and I want to jump in here because, and at first I want to point out that Jesus had his own informer, right. Judas. You know, I want to point out that that whole idea of agent provocateurs come from all the way back to the Tsar and Russia, right. et cetera. Every movement has always been infiltrated. Dr. King's movement was infiltrated. The, the key photographer for all of that civil rights stuff had always been working for the FBI. The... Uh, you know, I mean, throughout history, that's always going to happen because even when you don't participate in armed warfare or resistance, false flag organizations are developed. 
their agencies, uh, uh, like what happened in Germany, say, with the rights there. Uh, there are groups that are sent out to do things that's blamed on movements that are not participating in violence, and in turn, the reaction is still the same. So, I mean, yes, you need to organize in transparent ways, and you need to organize in, on the ground, but you also have to be aware that even when you're doing that, they still can put an informant in the, in the, in the area, like the New York 21, say, for instance. Right. Gene Roberts was a police officer. Explain who the New York 21 were. The New York 21 was 21 Panther leaders that were locked up in New York uh, as a result of a massive conspiracy to bomb the garden, New York Botanical Gardens, et cetera, et cetera. Well, it was orchestrated by a police officer right. that brought in the materials, brought in the maps, accused them. They end up going to jail. They spent two years in jail. It destroyed the New York uh, 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 Black Panther Party leadership. And they never broke a law. They never did anything. They got exonerated after two years of their trials. But here was this one state official that did that to them. So even when you don't engage in violence, you right. still can be set up by the state. Right, but the, the point is that that kind of a discussion would have never, never happened in the Southern Christian leadership. So they use these conspiracy laws to get mm -hmm. you dis to discuss the possibility. We've seen this with black bloc anarchists today. Mm -hmm. They get you to discuss the possibility of violence and then they can throw you in prison for even discussing it. Uh, and you know, I think that if we look back on that moment, which was uh, you know, extremely important moment in American history where there was real pushback against white supremacy, uh, you know, uh, the, the white elite, capitalism itself, um, the state effectively destroyed not only these radical movements, but the consciousness that these radical movements sought to create, unless you would disagree. Well, I don't disagree because like, uh, you can organize publicly and then your concerns about being infiltrated is more so than if you organize on the clandestine level. And then uh, the, even on the clandestine level, you have people that might be coming, coming, becoming informants. Like in my situation, I was captured in 1982, and I was set up for the FBI by the former Black Panther, who, had, who was recommended to assist me in my, my efforts to avoid capture, right? So, uh, but we just have, we, have to, we have to be more selective in what we do and who we, and who we pick to, to choose to, to operate with. Uh, the person that ha can't have a, a, any like of drug shortcomings or other kinds of weaknesses that the government can exploit. But what the government do, they study us as a people and find out what we like, what we don't like, and take it from there, right? So, so you have to be uh, more selective in your approach to as to who you pick. But part of the problem is that the state has such immense resources. And, and that's, that's not just part of the problem. That is what gives the state the advantage. Yes. Because uh, even as the, the Black Liberation Movement and other movements were being attacked, the organized capitalists also offshored all the industry. Right. It completely gutted the workforce. Right. Right. And that and and that left, especially in poor communities and black communities, that left massive unemployment, in which they then in turn yeah. pump drugs. No, in. you make a very important point, and this is uh, Christian Parente makes this point in his very good book, uh, Lockdown America: Police and Prisons in the Age of Crisis. And he writes a, exactly the point that you raise, where he says that while the Nixon era buildup had been a counter-revolutionary war by way of criminal justice and a technocratic reflex to social chaos, the second ongoing wave in the crackdown is not so overtly political. It is not about suppressing an American Mau Mau. Rather, it has been about managing and containing the new surplus populations created by neoliberal economic policies, even when these populations are not in rebellion. And so what you get within poor communities, and you're right to raise this point because we had two things going on neoliberal economics, which created endemic, chronic poverty and joblessness, coupled with an assault on people like you who were attempting to resist. You create what Steven Spritzer, a criminologist, describes as uh, cast-off populations, um, produced, of course, by capitalist exploitation. And one segment he calls 
perhaps a little cruelly, social junk. Um, these are the alcoholics, the people who've been broken in spirit, physically, the drug addicts. Um, and then the other are people like you who are the social dynamite. Um, and the way you control what he calls the social junk uh, is essentially to contain them. So we're here today now at a situation where while the state is not killing in the numbers that it killed in the 1960s, um, it's certainly killing at uh, a terrifying rate, two today, according to the Washington Post. Many of these people unarmed. It doesn't matter how much protest there is. Uh, we have seen in New York uh, and other cities uh, in the last few weeks assassinations of police officers. These have not been, whether they were political acts or not, they've not been characterized by the mainstream as political acts. Uh, and I'm asking you as revolutionaries, as people who rose up against this system, what are the lessons that you've learned that are applicable today, Audrey? That, uh, that resistance is possible because we don't have no choice, but to, we can remain a slave or, or rebel. I mean, we, should, we have to learn from our past mistakes to avoid future ones. And what, 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 what have you learned? What is the lesson? Uh, I, I was too trusting for one. Uh -huh. I, I, made, uh, I made liberal excuses for people that I shouldn't have been dealing with. I made, I made liberal excuses for people who had been using drugs and I shouldn't have, you know, this, should, this, should be, this should have been outed from the formation. And uh, like a lot of people have personal shortcomings of family ties that they, they, they maintain contacts with, it, with that, whereas they shouldn't have. You just have to you know, study. But is, was your decision to go underground in you know, an armed revolutionary movement, that's not a decision you would take back? No, no, because I'm still being oppressed. I don't have a choice in the matter. Either, like I said, just, just said, uh, I can remain a slave or rebel. You know, I chose to rebel. Eddie? Well, uh, well I think the things that we learned, uh, hopefully, that we have learned is that you have to organize in the communities, you know, community by community, and you have to try to do it legitimately. Uh, you have to recognize that you can still be framed. I'm an example of that. Right. Um, but in the face of all that, uh, the, the alternative is to accept the fact that there's, it's not just violence being committed by police or law enforcement elements or other kind of elements against individuals. It's massive violence by the capitalist system itself on the population. The, I mean, the, the, the infant mortality rate in the poor communities is astronomical. Which I, I just want to interrupt by saying it's worse today yeah, it's than worse. it was when you it's were a young worse. man. The houses are collapsing, oh, yeah. the, the, the hope is gone, the jobless is, is there. Yeah. I mean, that's violence, all right, that's violence. And it's violence that will destroy your people. It's violence that, that almost rises to the point of genocide. The Native Americans suffered that kind of violence. But it's uh, violence that Spritzer said, po points out, I think, okay. that creates this category that he calls social junk. People yes. who are so broken, which yeah. is the point. And that category continue to grow as the violence intensifies and the jobs disappear and uh, you have your school to prison pipelines, that area, which, and I disagree with his, his terminology, humans are humans. Right, no, it's, it's and, not a yeah, good term. Uh, and, but the amount of humans that are broken and shattered and destroyed as a result of this uh, economic arrangement, it has to be checked or it will continue to grow. Yeah. And then like, like, so like in our communities, in order to effectively organize, we need money. Because uh, you can't organize a hungry belly. Right. So if you don't have the money to meet people's basic needs, right, you know, they're going to turn away from you. That's when the government steps in and offer their, you know, what they call uh, uh, reforms. Right. So. All right. Thank you very much. You, you've been watching Days of Revolt with my guests, Eddie Conway and Audrey Latula. We've been talking about the rebellions, which they were part of, in the 1960s. In our second segment, uh, we're going to talk about rebelling inside prison, uh, which was uh, also part of a major uh, segment of their lives, 44 years in prison for Eddie 
and uh, 28 years for Archer. Uh, join us next week. Thank you very much. Thank you.